we're going to now talk about the earthworm, its anatomy, and how it moves. Earthworms are a little different in how they move from some of the other organisms we're going to talk about, in that they lack a skeletal system per se, and instead rely on a hydrostatic system, a system where moving water about by creating pressure is used to cause them to move. But to understand that, I like to describe it as almost like if you have any familiarity with hydraulics in a tractor, if you compress fluid in a closed cylinder, you create force. And this is essentially what a, a worm is doing, is creating force by forcing, constricting that water into a closed vessel, creating force. Right. To understand that, we're going to take a step back a little bit and quickly look at the anatomy of a worm. And essentially, a worm is a tube within a tube. If we look at our model here, we can see they've cut away the skin, and there's another tube inside the skin. That tube makes up the digestive tract and is actually hollow. So this purple tube is hollow and represents the digestive tract of the, the organism. The area outside that is called the coelom. And the coelom has fluid in it that if muscles contract, they're going to pressurize that fluid. And when you pressurize that fluid, it is going to move somewhere. If you look at the cross section of the worm down here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see that hopefully. This is a cross section of the worm looking down. And this would be the cross section of what Dr. Williams described as the intestinal tract. This is not segment. That's that open tube that runs the whole length of the worm. The larger cylinder here would be actually space here would be actually the coelom, and that's what we're going to be talking most about today. This is that fluid-filled vessel that runs back through the worm. And if you look, that is segmented. All these segments will there's their cross walls within this cylinder. By contracting either circular muscles that run around the worm or longitudinal muscles that run the length of the worm, the worm can compress a given segment of the worm. When you compress that given segment of the worm, you have the same amount of fluid in what is now a smaller volume so that basically the diameter increases and it swells a little bit. I don't know if you can see this. Dr. Williams mentioned circular muscles and longitudinal muscles, and we're going to move towards the screen up here. And, and this, is a, this is a diagram from your text, and I'd like to help with it in pointing this out. Again, this is a cross-section of the worm. This would be this cavity called the coelom that we're talking about today. Here's the intestinal tract. Just inside, we have an epidermis and we have a cuticle. Just inside that, there's a ring of circular muscles that go the whole way around the circumference of the worm. That's one layer of muscles. And these larger, internal to that, are these larger feathery type muscles, which are the longitudinal muscles. So we have the circular muscles here, longitudinal muscles here. And they're also surrounding the intestinal tract, but we're gonna concern ourselves most with the action of these muscles out here. One other structure we should probably point out while we're doing this are the setae. And these are the setae right here, and these are bristles. And you see they're a pair of bristles that protrude out from the worm, outside the worm, um, into the external environment. And these structures are involved of, of holding or anchoring the worm to a surface. And we'll talk about how they're involved in the movement in a little bit, but don't forget that these are the setae or, or bristles. It's obvious there's a whole bunch of other terms on this diagram we did not mention. There are things like the dorsal blood vessel. There is a ventral blood vessel. There are nerve cords. There are nephridia that act as kidney-like structures. And all of those are important to the anatomy, but they don't have a lot to do with how the worm moves. In, next, in the next few labs, we'll be talking about the function of, the, of, the, of those other structures. So do we want to jump to the movement of the worms? Okay. Exciting part. Here we go. 
Now we have five or six worms in this pan. Um, and these are essentially Canadian earthworms. They're, very, they're lar larger, and so we're trying to stimulate these worms to move across the surface to demonstrate how they coordinate the action of the circular and longitudinal muscles. And I'm trying to wake them up and have, here, that one woke up. Um, basically, we get an active worm to move here. And the way you can, the other thing, the other important thing to note here, you might want to look at the diagram as well. If you want to know the anterior and posterior of a worm, this little swollen-like structure here called, it's a band called the clitellum, and it's always going to be closest to the anterior of the mouth region, okay? And so if I essentially, it's just worm to move it like he's doing now, if I poke him here, he's probably going to move away from that stimulus as he's doing, and what I'm trying to show you here, if you would cooperate, is when they contract your circular muscles, not, most of these are not cooperating. They were moving a little bit ago. Come on, guys. Oops. They move, they move. We're just trying to st stimulate them to move by just gently touching Here's one that's moving in this direction. What we're trying to note here is the coordination. When you see the long, the worm get long and slender, it's a result of contracting the circular muscles, allowing it to slither across the surface. And when you see the worm begin to bunch up in those sections, that's due to the contraction of the longitudinal muscles. Okay? As they go across the more, so it's a parasolic motion back across the whole length of the worm. Circular muscle contraction to move forward, longitudinal muscle contraction to bunch up and bring the posterior parts forward. And this is kind of cool how they do that. That term peristolic motion is probably one you should remember. That while we're talking about earthworms today, later on when you talk about anatomy and talk about the movement of, of food through the intestine, you'll talk about a peristolic motion where basically the muscles in your intestine are doing the same mm -hmm. thing as the earthworm is, in this case, to move what's inside them rather than actually move around on a surface. And remember, we talked about the movement, how muscles move bones. And so bones provide a point of attachment for muscles, so they have something to pull against and move that bone. Um, there, are no, there are no bones in this structure. So what are the muscles pulling against here to move the animal? And remember we mentioned the bristles of the CT before? They're the bristles, and think about this, when the worm is sliding across the surface, when the circular muscles are contracted, do you think these CT are up or down, or are they retracted, or are they on the surface? What about when the longitudinal muscles contract? Do you think the CT are holding the worm fast, allowing the longitudinal muscles to pull against something to move it? So, with that said, when the worm is contracting the circular muscles and moving across the surface, those CT are up, allowing it to glide across the surface. And they're down to hold the worm fast to the surface so the longitudinal muscles have something to pull against. They're pulling the body up against that. And so, that's point. So anything else you wanna? Uh, well, no, I think we have to do the other experiment. We tilt. Oh, the, the effect of gravity on the movement of a worm. Now, worms tend to, where do they live? They live in the soil and burrows. And so they have the ability to possibly respond to gravity. Um, so we tilt the pan here. They do nothing. <laughs> we do nothing. You know, some students, and when we do this experiment, I don't know, 50% of the time the, the worms will move up against gravity, 50% of the time they'll move down. So, um, but they have the ability to move in both directions. What happens when it rains a lot? Worms come out of the burrow. Um, because worms will drown in their burrow because there's essentially their burrow gets saturated, so they have to have the ability to move out. So a worm that's moving down, another one that's moving up. So I think that's an amazing way to move, amazing adaptation for motion. Um, how they can move without even any kind of bony like structures at all. It is amazing. Now the question in your lab report you might have to consider is why can't we, why can't the hydrostatic motion 
um, allow us to move as terrestrial animals? What does it, what does this type of skeleton not provide us for terrestrial animals? Okay. And certainly, if you're thinking about that, look at how Dr. Nolte is standing right now. He's standing straight up, holding his entire mass against the gravity that's pulling him down. Mm -hmm. Think about the amount of pressure it would take to do that if he only had a hydrostatic skeleton. And, and what would this be by walking motion? Would a hydrostatic would a hydrostatic skeleton provide enough bony of bones for attachment and muscles to move that intricate motion. So consider that. I guess I'll finish with saying, we're not saying particularly that skeletal systems are better than hydrostatics. Both are an adaptation to the environment. The hydrostatic system works beautifully for the environment earthworms live in. It might not work so well for the environment we're living in. All organisms are adapted to their environment. 